Scott Simon, um, our guest this afternoon, is of course the um, the host and voice of NPR's uh, Weekend Edition Saturday, and he's uh, also um, a host of CBS uh, Sunday Morning correspondent. correspondent, CBS Sunday Morning. He's <clears throat> working his way to <laughs> to host. Um, he's um, he's he's uh, one of America's uh, best known broadcasters and has won every major award in, in broadcasting. Uh, he's also written several previous nonfiction books about adoption, Jackie Robinson, and his own life as a, a very avid fan, um, plus, uh, plus a couple, couple of novels. Uh, but he's here to talk about his latest work, uh, Unforgettable, A Son, A Mother, and the Lessons of a Lifetime. Uh, the book, the book uh, developed uh, out of a series of Twitter messages uh, sent by Scott and followed by more than a million people in the summer of 2013 as he sat with his dying 84-year-old mother in an intensive care unit in Chicago, uh, reflecting on a, on a woman who not only had been a devoted parent, but also uh, quite a, a colorful, colorful person. While the tweets expressed much of Scott's love for uh, his mother, in her final days, the memoir provides a much fuller portrait uh, of this one-time showgirl and a touching tribute to their uh, shared lives. In a review of Unforgettable, um, uh, one paper uh, called it, quote, a book that matches its title. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Scott Simon. Well, thank you very much, uh, and it's always good to be here. I was uh, telling uh, this this remarkable store, which uh, I, I love the fact that they say they're 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 out to make books popular entertainment again, <laughs> and so they are. And th thanks very much for inviting us. Um, I, I must say, for this book in particular, to Brad and and, and Lisa, uh, and I see a lot of uh, a lot of friends here. And colleagues, I'm not going to make uh, an attempt to introduce everybody. It's also good when you're on tour with a book to see a lot of total strangers here. Uh, <laughs> I don't mind telling you. If I if I could, however, introduce my family, my wonderful wife Caroline, the stunning <laughs> dark-haired woman, one of the stunning dark-haired women in there, and our daughters Elise Sylvie GMA Simon and Paulina Lumon Simon. Um, who, by the way, significantly are going to listen to me do a little kind of pre-book talk uh, patter and then leave. Uh, or at least go, you go downstairs to the kids section and where the food is, right? Yeah. I also, my colleague Steve Inskeep, who did that wonderful interview on uh, Morning Edition, is here. And I have, um, I've done a lot of interviews. Uh, over the past three weeks, and Steve's, uh, the one he did was undoubtedly the best. And uh, it's, it's so good to see him. I also, uh, under the rubric of, of, yeah, a family, the Shulmans of Chicago are here. Um, the Shulmans of, uh, our families go back a long time. Are there, how many Shulmans are there today here? I don't know. Uh, it, it, four, four Shulmans are here today. Mark Shulman, um, uh, Eli's, Eli Shulman in Chicago ran a very famous stage delicatessen, which I talk about uh, in the book. And then uh, Eli's the place for steak where my mother took me for uh, my 14th birthday and we didn't have quite enough money to cover the check. Uh, actually, we covered the check, not the tips, because everyone was so nice to us, so we, uh, we, we snuck out. And this is described, <laughs> this is described uh, in the book. Uh, Mark has taken his father's cheesecake recipe and made it into the great Chicago cheesecake. Uh, uh, Mayor Emanuel famously sends cheesecakes to people to say thank you if he's not sending them dead fish wrapped up in newspaper. <laughs> uh, they've done the president's inaugural cheesecake. Um, I, I think anybody here with NPR knows that I've brought in the more than occasional Eli's of Chicago cheesecake that uh, everyone, uh, everyone has enjoyed. A few weeks ago, because Mark and Maureen are now preparing an Eli's cookbook, um, came across a letter, which is very significant for me to quote from today. It was October 25th, 2002. <clears throat> to Mark and Maureen, this Sunday, Scott will be appearing at Borders, Michigan Avenue at 2 p.m. 
in view of television sports events every Sunday, I fear that this could diminish his audience. If you could supply any bodies to paper the house, it would be most appreciated. <laughs> Love, Pat. Of course, that was my mother. Uh, so they are here to paper the house today, too. Thank, thank you very much uh, for being with us. Let me, uh, let me, if I can, begin at almost the beginning. Death makes life worthwhile. It gives each moment meaning. I hope I live to 150 and that our daughters can make it to at least 200. But death drives life. It frightens and inspires us. Do away with death and we'd have no reason to get out of bed or into it grow, work, or love. Why would we do much of anything if we had the time for everything? It's the certainty of death that moves us to sing and write poems, find friends, and sail across oceans and skies. It's because we know that we don't have all the time in the world that we try to use the uncertain and unknowable time that we have to do something that endures. Death is sad, grim, unwelcome, and invaluable. It's why we try to make something of life. It's why we have children. Um, when I went to join my mother in the uh, intensive care unit, um, July of 2013, I, I, I didn't know that she was going to wind up dying there. I, I, I certainly, she was 84, she'd been through bouts of cancer. I certainly knew that it was uh, serious. Um, I, I didn't know it would wind up that way when we flew across the country. We were in California then waiting for her to join us. Um, and I decided that first night that I was, going to, I was going to sleep next to her in the ICU. The first night I was in blankets and, and pillows, and that wasn't very comfortable. So the next day I was passing uh, an outdoor store in Chicago on North Michigan Avenue and decided, well, I'm going to go in there and get one of these orange camp mats. Um, I walked in there and said to the first young man who approached, the only thing I know about the outdoors is that I loathe them. <laughs> and without missing a beat, he said, well, well, perhaps I can direct you to Bloomingdale, sir. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I said, you know, you're really much too funny to be working at an outdoor store. And, and he said, well, as a matter of fact, I do a little, imp little improv on the side. Um, <laughs> But certainly within a few days, uh, spending that time with my mother, it, it became obvious that, uh, well, the hereafter was no longer um, hypothetical. Uh, it became the next territory ahead. Um, and uh, occasioned a lot of reminiscing and um, that, that undergirded the entire time that we spent together uh, over those days. A couple of weeks or three weeks ago, I guess it's been now, the New York Times had me asked me to do a piece about why they, they thought the story of, of my mother, I really don't want to use the term, um, go viral, uh, why it had taken digital wings. And, and I've just got a, a kind of very unsatisfying half answers. Uh, one is that's yeah, certainly universal story um, of, of life and death, a uh, story of love between a mother and a son. Um, I also think it's possible that, that social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, and, and others that uh, Instagram that are being invented and that will come along have sort of become our papyrus scrolls in this century, um, where we pass on scraps of our lives to be read, shared, or ignored, uh, or ignored and discovered later as the, as the young man who's uh, been appointed to replace Jon Stewart on The Daily Show uh, has been discovering. But I do think that, you know, the strongest reason was just my mother. She was just so funny and interesting. Um, people like Steve and I and Jackie Lydon and I and, and others uh, who are here in, interview a lot of ostensibly interesting and well-known people, but I think we'd be the first to tell you, often the most interesting things we hear in the course of a day are not from the people that we interview because they're pretty much on message. Uh, they're from the people who might be in front of you at Starbucks or the people across from you. Uh, on the subway, uh, or uh, within your own family, because I shamelessly quote my uh, ceaselessly brilliant daughters uh, and my wife. And um, my mother was just so funny and interesting. The, 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 the confines of my world kind of shrunk to the four walls of the ICU, but that was, that was hardly confining. She was enormously entertaining. There are students at a, uh, the Big Nay National High School in Valenzuela City in the Philippines. 
uh, who read the tweets of some of what my mother said and picked out some of their favorite line and wrote papers about what she said. Um, some of the tweets. My mother in ICU sees Kate and Will holding baby and tears. Every baby boy is a little king to his parents. Um, when my mother is struggling for sleep in the pain, listening to Lob OM, Bocelli, mother can't keep eyes closed. Maybe opera will help. I always slept when I went. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, one that's gotten around a lot. I consider this a good sign. Mother says when the time comes, Obit headline should be three Jewish husbands, but no guilt. Um, the reviews have, 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 uh, have been quite kind, and um, I'm sorry, I just can't tell you what it's like to have a picture with your mother's book on the cover on the New York Times bestseller list. <laughs> um, I, I think the re review from which Brad quoted, because I, I know this one pretty well, is from Carlos Lozado of the Washington Post. Um, and it was, uh, it was I'm not, I'm not going to be immodest enough to quote from it, but I'm, I'm going to be smug enough to paraphrase. Um, and Carlos Lozado, uh, I, I think a great review can make not just even the author, but sometimes especially the author, recognize some themes that, that were always in the work, but that he or she hadn't quite identified. And, and he noted that the book is also a remembrance of my mother's friends. Uh, on the near north side uh, of Chicago in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, working women, like my mother, uh, and men who uh, in the 60s and 70s were still called confirmed bachelors or, or simply creative. Um, they worked in clubs and shops and they dated some nice guys and an awful lot of, of cads and, and or schlemiels. Uh, or perhaps here at Politics and Prose, I can even say schmucks. Um, in the interest of clarity. And losing, losing them, I think, was the hardest part of growing older for my mother, uh, and not just my mother. She said she sometimes cringed when she would hear the phone ring. She, uh, uh, she knew that it would be some young voice on the end saying, hi, Pat, I'm Betsy's niece, and I hate to tell you. Um, so let me read a couple of sections that tells you a bit about some of uh, my mother's friends, my aunties and my uncles. For years, my mother's constant running mate and gal pal was the woman we called Auntie Chris. She'd come to Chrysula from a Greek family in Iowa, birth name Chrysula, and indeed possessed the kind of silhouette art teachers and gentlemen used to call classical. Her Aphrodite form helped her find work as a hostess and dancer in clubs along Rush Street when she first hit town, which is where she met my mother and, she said, bundles of big-toothed, tousle-haired Kennedy boys sitting with Chicago mobsters. By the way, I read this section the other night in Connecticut, and how conveniently there was a member of the Kennedy family sitting there, <laughs> as, uh, as there may be today. So I'll look forward to meeting you afterwards. Um, Chris was hard-headed and droll. She was an outspoken Iowa Republican who was suspicious of what she saw as the local Blarney, Guff, and Moonshine, and thought my mother, whom she loved, could be sweetly naive about men, business, and Democrats. Burn their bras, she'd exclaim, standing tall with Iowa's Zoftig. Why would these gals want to burn their bras? My bra is my best friend. <laughs> there was Melba, a media buyer for whom my mother worked as a secretary at an ad agency on Michigan Avenue. Melba gleamed. She was silvery, saucy, and the wit in my mother's circle, whom we all waited to hear. One night, someone in the group came back from a drugstore with one of the first dental machines that spurts water through your gums. He filled a small tank, held up a wand, pressed a button, and a hard burst of water, and I dare say the correct word for this is spume, um, spurted from the nozzle. My mother and her friends filled the tank over and over. They giggled as it gushed and dripped, gushed and dripped. They aimed the spurts at each other like kids at a squirt gun fight, tittering, ooh, it likes you, <laughs> and ooh, it doesn't last very long. The laughter wound down after we'd filled the tank half a dozen times and saw numerous emissions. I think a couple of the women lit cigarettes. Melba waited, Melba waited for the quiet to ask, and could you also use that on your teeth? <laughs> Our daughters are downstairs, Charlie. Okay. 
Uh, I had no idea what she meant. I knew Melba was hilarious. There was Auntie Abba, who was blonde, tall, slim, and walked like a samba, to recall a phrase of the time, as she balanced a Chicago phone book on her head. Auntie Abba may have been the first person I knew who spoke with a British accent. She was about as British as Dolly Parton. <laughs> Abba was from Baton Rouge and worked for her posh enunciation as assiduously as actors from the Royal Shakespeare Company now learn Bayou accents to play Americans. I won't have people up here ask me just about corn liquor and skinning alligators, she said. Uh, Abba trained Playboy bunnies for clubs around the country. She taught the Playboy way to smile, say hello, and deliver drinks with the bunny dip, the maneuver by which they could put a blue Hawaiian in front of a customer without revealing cleavage. Abba disdained, and when Abba disdained, drip disdain, it was a powerful, toxic stream. The criticism Gloria Stein had made of Playboy's bunny costumes as being painful and demeaning. Uniforms, Abba corrected all, uniforms. And they wear some pretty painful and ridiculous costumes at the Metropolitan Opera, too. Over the years, I think I've quoted Auntie Abba more times than any presidential inaugural address I've ever covered. And I think that she and Gloria Steinem would have liked each other. And by the way, was it the Upper West Side the other night? I had the pleasure of signing a copy for Gloria Steinem. So we'll, we'll find out, we'll find out if that's the case. There was Auntie Marion, a former lounge singer who performed up and down Rush Street before marrying Charlie Grimm, the old Chicago Cub first baseman and manager. Marion believed that cigarettes sweetened a voice. She did a lot of sweetening. For years, she carried a fluffy little white pom-pom of a poodle named Sugar in her purse. She wouldn't get home until after the last set and a last drink at two or three in the morning. This was not a good time to walk a dog who couldn't bite through a jelly donut. So Marion spread the Tribune over the kitchen floor of her studio apartment, a room she otherwise might see only to get fresh ice cubes for scotch, where Sugar could drop her sweet widow fudgy sickles. <laughs> Little Sugar would squat and quiver over the unfurled front page. Auntie Chris would shout, aim for Mayor Daly, aim for Mayor Daly. <laughs> Do you remember when we had to spring Chris and Marion from jail, my mother asked from her hospital bed. Highlight of my childhood, I told her. And I'll explain, Chris and Marion went out for a hamburger on Weld Street one night. They were driving, uh, turned the wrong way, I guess, down the street. The policeman uh, stopped them. Turned out neither of them were carrying uh, a license. And, and, and please, uh, Auntie Chris said, <laughs> is that what things are coming to in this town under Dick Daly? You need a license to run out for a hamburger? <laughs> I remember the tone of wonder and worry in my mother's voice when she heard this account and she said softly, Oh, Chris. What my mother said now was they were lucky the police didn't drag them to Devil's Island. <laughs> that night we pulled on clothes as if we heard a fire bell. We looked for bail money in the days before automated teller machines and my mother plucked a stack of 20 she tucked under tissue paper in her lingerie drawer. We snagged a cab on North State Parkway, and I got to tell the driver, Chicago Avenue Police Station, please, and step on it. <laughs> you can imagine how exciting that is when you're 11. Um, the station house was blindingly bright inside and crackled and squawked with police radios. A pretty mother with her son in tow drew stairs. Good morning, Captain, my mother told the desk sergeant, as if he were the captain of a cruise ship. We'd like to see a couple of your guests. <laughs> the desk sergeant didn't need to consult his blotter. A blue circle of officers surrounded aunties Chris and Marion, who were somewhat to my disappointment, unshackled. Marion roosted on the edge of a desk. Someday he'll come along. <laughs> she sang in a smoky, dusky voice. And he'll be big and strong. <laughs> This is an inspired uh, choice for a station house. There, there is no arrest, no bail, just the mildest reminder from the police to stop at stop signs and carry your license when operating a motor vehicle. A kitten-haired young patrolman told Marion, sure, I'm a cop, but really I want to be a singer. She took his hand and brushed it with her lips. Follow your dream, darling, she told him. I sat on my mother's lap in the cab riding back north, Chris and Marion cackling beside us. The second sergeant we saw was handsome, married for sure. You checked his hand, don't you? The lieutenant was a better dresser. Officers get better uniforms, but believe me, said Auntie Chris, they all wind up wearing those funny little golf shirts and saggy slacks. <laughs> my mother leaned behind my ear to tell me, 
I don't want you to think that jail is always this much fun. <laughs> what I remember of that group of women from my boyhood is lingering impromptu evenings with lots of snorts and laughs, olives and cheddar cheese on rye crackers, the stroke of matches, the tinkle of ice, compact makeup mirrors folded with a snap, high heels under the coffee table, crinkled cocktail napkins with lipstick smudges, earrings pulled out and resting on a coaster, Tony Bennett on the turntable, an occasional crying jag and the orange glow of cigarettes, candles, and streetlights just below the windows. I don't remember, or more likely didn't recognize, profound conversations, but I knew the buzz of laughs and gossip was a fizz that refilled my mother and her friends. Most of the women in her circle had been married at least once. A couple would be again. My mother thought one or two might have preferred women, but in those times, finding the right man was believed to be therapy for that. Single working women have children on their own today. My mother didn't think most of her friends would have wanted that. Instead, these tough, funny, and resilient women turned their care and tenderness on the child in front of them. They loved you so, my mother said now. I love them. I was blessed. But my mother's friends, and my father for that matter, passed on to me a phrase for the kind of man they admired. A classy guy. The accolade had nothing to do with money, business, or breeding. Ernie Banks, may he rest in peace, and my school principal, Mort Reisman, were classy guys. So were Adley Stevenson, Nat King Cole, Sir Noel Coward, and the man who drove the number 36 bus down State Street. A classy guy had manners. He said, please and thank you, Mr. and Miss, and held open doors. Classy guys picked up checks. They left good tips. They dressed with respect. They kept their word. They sent flowers. They apologized personally. They tried to be kind and courteous, even if they sometimes had to be firm. And their best jokes were about themselves. My mother's friends had learned all this by knowing a few classy guys and many who weren't. Mistakes, good times, lonely nights, and hard-won laughs had taught them what counted in a man's character. They passed on what they learned to me in dozens of stories. They gave me something to steer toward. My mother's circle of friends also gave me a glimpse of good friendship. Friends were the people you called at 3 a.m. to get you out of jail. But they were also the people who were with you at 9 p.m. on a slow Saturday night. Friends shared crisis, and they shared what was often the trickier test of tedium. My mother's humor and strength sometimes made it hard to see how much of her life had been busted. But her friendships with such rugged, chic, and appealing women gave her other lives to care about and gave her his purpose, shape, and laughter. Um, my mother and I sat up at one point for 48 hours straight, more or less, in the ICU, and we talked about her friends, and we talked about uh, her three marriages. Um, we talked about her uh, her love of art because as a working girl on Rush Street she had uh, really, she said, first gone into the Art Institute because it was the first building in Chicago that had kind of universal air conditioning in the middle of the summer. Uh, and she said you could walk from room to room or just sit, look and dream. It was like a vacation. There was Gauguin. There was Van Gogh. Right, politics and prose. There was Van Gogh. Um, <laughs> Outside were the buses and trains and the police sirens, but inside there was Tahiti. There was a street in Paris. There was a ballet dancer in her dressing room. We talked uh, about her old boyfriends, or at least a fraction of them, uh, the ones I could remember. Um, we talked about suicide, and, and maybe I, I didn't quite realize until I spent that time with her how uh, my mother's adult life had been a struggle with suicide. Her mother had been a suicide. I think she was uh, 44 when she took her life. And my mother was 23. And uh, as my mother said, it puts a fly in your head. You never, you never quite get it out. Um, and there were times in the book um, when she was tempted, that I describe in the book, and times that I, I talked about with Steve in, in that interview when, when she actually did make uh, an attempt. But it is a testament to uh, my mother's endurance and courage that uh, she sucked every last second out of life and, and, and lived to the age of 84. Um, I have a section in the book where I talk about how my mother loved to entertain, because we, we recollected this with each other. 
Um, she couldn't have large parties in the one-bedroom box of an apartment um, on Elm Street that we had, but my mother would bring five or six people around a small round table and set out white plates. Um, she entertained friends to thank them for trudging through snow uh, to see me in a school play or uh, to console a friend who had lost her job or her boyfriend um, or congratulate a friend who had lost her job or her boyfriend. Um, <laughs> She gathered a group in front of the TV to eat, take out chow mein uh, and watch a world crisis uh, or the Wizard of Oz or the World Series or the Miss America pageant. Um, she, would, she would bring up card tables from our storage locker to seat a dozen people for, for Christmas Hanukkah dinners uh, because in our mixed faith family, that's, they fused them together. And, and she would plunk little menorahs uh, on the table right next to the little Virgin Mary votive lights that she would get. <laughs> at Mexican markets and people would say, Patty, those are, those are religious symbols. And she would say, well, they just make the table look so pretty. And isn't that what the holidays are all about? Um, I, I'm going to read one last section that I have in the book about an afternoon of what I came to think of as her most accomplished and signature bit uh, of entertaining. There was a man in Chicago uh, who I think the Chicagoans here uh, will remember, but he even had a national reputation. His name was Lar America First Daily, and he ran for everything on the ballot. And he campaigned in an Uncle Sam hat, often full Uncle Sam suit. And I talk about his national reputation because he famously won a Supreme Court suit under the equal time provisions, uh, and actually had to go on the Tonight Show for the same amount of time as the major party presidential candidates under the old equal time provisions. Um, I was running <laughs> into the ground, I'm sure, uh, an underground newspaper, and uh, the editorial board and I um, sent <laughs> letters to every candidate on the ballot inviting them to meet with us in, in pursuit of our valuable editorial endorsement. And, you know, not even the vegetarians and the prohibitionists wrote back, but Laura America First Daily, God bless him, <laughs> wrote back. And so we had to schedule a, a, an interview with our editorial board. Uh, after geometry class, and <laughs> let me describe his visit. Lar Daly wore a worn old gray suit with elephant ear lapels for our meeting, but doffed his towering Uncle Sam hat to my mother when she opened the door. Ah, sure is nice to enter hostile territory, he said, and see a pretty face. I forget what urgent questions we asked Lar Daly. He said a few crackpot things I can't recall, and several that made our editorial board of sardonic youngsters roll our eyes. Public schools are a mess, and the U.S. government snoops on everybody. Things that today make me wonder why we sneered. <laughs> Lar Daly brightened when my mother asked about his Uncle Sam hat. You don't sort of buy that in a costume shop, do you, she asked. I can tell from here. The stitching is exquisite. <laughs> Good eye, ma'am. Got a Lithuanian gal. Works for me. Sews it all by hand. I go through two or three of these a year. You see, I keep stuff in here, he shook papers out of the bottom of his hat, kind, kind of like my office, so I can keep both hands free to meet people. Lincoln kept his office in his hat, too, when he was a young buck prairie lawyer. People laughed at him in those days, too, trying to be a lawyer, no education, that squeaky voice, those long legs growing out of his suits. Our editorial board had been in session for more than an hour, and Lar Daly, who did not otherwise invite much comparison with Lincoln, um, <laughs> picked up his hat and began his goodbyes. I know you must have a campaign appearance to make, my mother told him, but please don't run off until we've at least given you a drink for your trouble. He did have one, scotch rocks as I recall, and then one more for the road. My mother brought out peanuts and some kind of cheese with little toasts. You know, I run a bar stool company, he told us. Business is okay, but the glory days is back when I was young in the 30s. Bookies needed stools. You know why, Mrs. Simon? My mother leaned forward. I was a child. Like, they couldn't sit at desks and post the numbers on a blackboard. So they sat and stood on stools. The cops knew where all the betting parlors were because they'd bust them. Well, I'd tell the cops, give me an address and you'll get 50 cents for each stool we sell. The cops would rate them every few weeks, remove the furniture, and the books would just reopen and buy more stools. <laughs> Kept business flowing, let me tell you. The second scotch and the reminisce seemed to make Lar Daly's eyes a little watery. But I guess the glory days but I guess the glory days are always when we're young. Right, Mrs. Simon? You are so right, Mr. Daly, she told him. I got six kids, he said between sips. All grown now. 
I know people make jokes about me. I always worried about them getting hurt. Hey, your dad, that crazy guy in the Uncle Sam suit? Kids can be jerks. But I tell my kids, and Mrs. Simon, I'm going to tell your boy right here, hey, you can't let a little razzing get you down. You got to do what you believe in. Hey, they all laughed at Christopher Columbus, didn't they? But he sure brought home the gold. You were the soul of graciousness that day, I told my mother, with a man most people would have laughed down the stairs. He was a guest in our home, she said. I'm, I'm not sure I'd want him to be president. <laughs> or, or even dog catcher. But he sure dedicated his life, didn't he? You saw that, I told her. I was trying to be sophisticated and cynical, like a journalist in the movies, and just saw the crackpot. You were gracious and found the human being. I'm going to go forward to, uh, to one last section and entertaining. Is that? Oh, it's going right by us here. OK. But <laughs> something we should worry about. Um, my children are safely away, right? OK. So we're in the hospital. Um, the entertaining you did, I told her. I figured out a few years ago why. Why not? It was fun. Well, it was just you and me. Dad wasn't around or dependable, but you enlarged our circle. You gave a kind of home to all the aunties and the uncles. They taught me stuff and enriched our lives. You gave them something too, baby, my mother told me. It's, it's hard to be alone like they were. Maybe some of that's changing. Do you remember High's little joke, I asked her? He had so many. This one was really raw. Oh, that one, my mother laughed. High was a boxer, former boxer from Los Angeles who became a brassiere salesman. <laughs> Natural progression. <laughs> Hi, the boxer who became the bra man was a guest one night when my mother had six or eight people at the table and on the couch and talked her into a story in the paper about an assistant coach on the Chicago Bears who had such an unruly appetite. He run out of the team's training camp in rural Indiana to eat raw ears of corn. Raw, said Auntie Chris with contempt. Utterly raw, can you imagine? And he's not some poor migrant worker, but a fat, well-fed coach. How can he discipline young men? Raw, she repeated. Utterly raw. <laughs> After a lot of yucks and oohs around the table, High piped up. All that corn silk, he said. He probably just thought he was eating a blonde. <laughs> Now, <laughs> I'm, I, I'm going to bring this back to poignant now, OK? <laughs> the living room roared and rocked with laughter. I felt my face flush as people looked to see if I understood what High had said. I was about 12 and didn't. But to try to look wise, I joined the laughing until all the aunties and uncles began to lean across the table to kiss my forehead and rustle my hair. I realized in the wash of loving laughter that followed a foul, funny joke I didn't understand that my mother had made a pretty sweet place for me in the world. Um, I'm going to stop with the readings there. Uh, I want to invite your questions. Obviously, um, time I hope to sign uh, books. Um, I hope I've already made the case that, you know, this is. Um, a book with sex, adultery, life, death, love. <laughs> All the things we look for in fine literature. Uh, and a number of, uh, of good naughty jokes in there. Um, I also hope it's a story that, that maybe peels back uh, the heart of love a little bit. Um, you know, my, as I said, to, to have my mother's face on the cover of a book on the New York Times bestseller list is I really can't imagine, because um, my mother was not a Bush or a Kennedy or a Windsor or a, a Kardashian, um, and she wasn't a Hollywood star or a public uh, intellectual or, or a corporate tycoon uh, or a politician. Um, but she was, and, and Scott Turow knew my mother pretty well, as he wrote, gorgeous and charming and relentlessly honest, um, a true star to the very end. And I think, too, as I've been doing interviews for the past three weeks, um, it's kind of crystallized in my mind. Um, I, th I think one of my mother's great traits was her genius for forgetting. 
Um, you know, because she, she forgot old hurts and slights and insults. She, she left behind a lot of tragedies uh, and hurts. Um, I did an interview in, um, uh, in Texas where, uh, in fact, the interviewer was uh, Joyce Slocum, the former president of National Public Radio, who warmed up at NPR and is now the president of Texas Public Radio. Finally, a job big enough for Joyce. And, uh, Joyce is an attorney by training, and, and she said, you know, if, if I looked at your mama's life, I would make a case for my client to get off any charge in the world because of what happened to her. Uh, I mean, my mother was the only child of parents who could be indifferent about her. She, uh, uh, she loved and married a wonderful, entertaining, charming man, my father, uh, who was a comedian who, uh, who was drinking himself to death, and she had to, she had to jump out of that marriage really for my sake. Um, she lost a daughter. Uh, her mother took her life when she needed her most. Um, she had to jump out of the marriage uh, uh, to my father. Uh, then she married a wonderful guy. Uh, Ralph Newman was his name for 25 years, and then, and then he was convicted of a federal crime. Um, a lot of people would have used, I could go on, but a lot of people would have used any one of those events to immobilize their lives to paralyze themselves, to say, I, there's no getting on with life until I get over this. She didn't do that. She kept on going. She kept on moving. Um, she kept on doing that for me. Um, but she kept going through life because she realized, I think, the, the preciousness that we all have of that one opportunity. Um, she lived through a lot, and, and she also left a lot behind. Um, I'm going to take questions now, but for people who buy a book today, a little gift my wife and I had printed. Um, I think I end the book with these. Probably shouldn't read the very end of the book, but I will. <laughs> Bookmarks for everyone here today. Write thank you. It says, Patricia Lyons, Simon Newman, Gelbin's advice for a good life. Write thank you notes. Tip well. Sing. Drink responsibly. Remember that good manners cost nothing and open doors. Reach out to someone who is lonely. Make them laugh. Help people smile. Well, any questions you have, please. Oh, not bad. And I think we, we want people to migrate to the microphones, right, if they have questions? Okay. Hello. Hi there, ma'am. Hi, Mr. Simon. I'm an admirer of yours uh, through NPR. Um, I would like to ask you, uh, how was it like to grow up with your mom? And what, was, what do you think it was one of her biggest challenges as a mother? Her biggest challenge as a mother was undoubtedly her son. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I had a great childhood. I think I said to Steve that, you know, I, 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 I began to go to grammar school at a time when the whole idea of school counselors was foreign, and then they began to come in uh, in, in mass. And I, I remember, I think I was probably in the sixth grade, and there was a school counselor who, looking back on it, probably, I think, tried to convince me that I should develop a trauma. Um, you know, because after all, my parents were divorced, and that was kind of unusual in those days. And, and other things that, you know, and my father had a drinking problem, which was very well known, alas. I had a great time as a childhood. My mother, was, you know, as a child, my mother was funny, vibrant, uh, hysterical. Uh, and a lot of fun, and and my father, and and uh, who was drinking himself to death, but he was he was insofar as he could as he could summon himself to do it. He was a he was a very loving father, and I, I had no doubt that I was surrounded by love and people who cared about me and people who wanted the best things for me in life. So I I had a I had a great time. Uh, there's also the possibility that I was just you know, uh, blithe to all that was happening around me. <laughs> but uh, I just had a great time. Great, thank you. Yeah. Yes, yes. Thank, thank you very much. Um, first of all, just the connection of tears and laughter is just so poignant, really appreciate that. But my question is, what was your mother's relationship like with your daughters? Because they're oh. all women who you loved so much. Um, she was very glad to be uh, to be a, a grandmother and to, and to be their grandmother. Uh, we would come to her apartment uh, in Chicago for breakfast, and if our daughters had, had, had stared at anything for more than a second, it would be on the table. 
So the breakfast there would be, I mean, my gosh, bacon and rye toast and whole wheat toast and bananas and strawberries with sugar and, and uh, lemon hummus, because I think they once said they liked lemon hummus. And, and um, she, you know, she loved, being, uh, she loved being their grandmother. She loved being a grandmother. It, it should be said, though, because my wife and I had said to her on a few occasions, um, you know, maybe we should get you an apartment in, in, in our building and you can, and, and she, she loved being a grandmother, but she wasn't ready to just be granny, to live in a studio apartment in our building and, you know, and, and wait for four o'clock every afternoon to hear the little fingers knocking on her door to come in for yet another epical snack. Um, so she, she loved being a grandmother and yeah, I, there's a, I think, I, I believe I do tell the story in the book. Um, the night before her first cancer surgery, we went to, to dinner downtown in Chicago. And, hi there, baby. And uh, Elise was the only, uh, was the only daughter that we, uh, we had then. And um, we went back through a, a classy hotel where, where generations of Sullivans, Peter, had, had worked, Irish immigrants to Chicago, shaken sheets at the Drake Hotel. And my mother was very insistent on showing Elise a uh, ladies' room, the ladies' room. Uh, at this fancy hotel because it was uh, to Lisa and her bud Anna. Uh, and uh, she, for some reason she said, you know, you re the, I really want to show Elise the, uh, the ladies room. And uh, my mother's third husband and I sat outside waiting for them. And when uh, our, our family came outside, Elise and my mother and, and my wife, Carolina, Caroline's eyes were watering. And I wondered what went on in there. <laughs> And apparently, my mother had uh, had rubbed the creams and the ointments that were. Now, my mother, you know, when she when she was working up and down Rush Street or on Michigan Avenue, uh, I, and I think any Chicagoan um, would would have an idea of snug hotel lobbies where you could walk to get out of the wind and the cold during the winter. And and you know, my mother would, for example, work at the Singapore on on Rush Street and then change clothes to to work somewhere else, and and often at the in, in the ladies' room there. Uh, which is where the Sullivans usually had to come through the employees' entrance, Peter, you will appreciate, and the Sullivans and the Lions. And, uh, and um, in any event, my, uh, it was very important to my mother to show this to Elise, so they came out of the bathroom. And according to my wife, my mother had said to Elise, Honey, never, never be afraid to go into a classy place. Remember, you deserve it. And uh, I said to her in the hospital, um, this is an example of how we can, I think, overanalyze in our business. Um, Mother, were you trying to say as the, <laughs> as the child of Irish immigrants to America, an unfeeling America, try and tell this beloved little granddaughter herself an immigrant to America? To, oh, and she said, no. I, I just didn't think that, you know, maybe I would be around to take her to the Art Institute, so the nicest place I could show her was this lady's room. <laughs> but uh, she did want to say, never be afraid to go into a classy place. You deserve it. Sorry. Hello. Thank you so much. I wondered if you could comment on your mother and how she dealt with the health care system and what your impressions were of her care and, and the intensive care unit or, or an earlier too. Well, um, I, I talk a little bit about this in the book. Uh, in fact, the book is dedicated to the people who work in intensive care units and in uh, hospital emergency rooms, and nurses and technicians who are the most accomplished, selfless, um, amazing group of professionals you will ever encounter. Uh, the kindness uh, that, they, that they gave my mother and, and really all of us in, in the family uh, was ex exquisite and extraordinary, and and routine. I mean, my, my mother was a compelling personality, but I don't know how many people uh, in that intensive care unit in Chicago they've they've seen through to the portal of death at this point, and I'm I'm certain with the same degree of care and consideration. We we had some problems with the doctors, uh, who were mostly invisible, and and I I guess maybe that's. That's getting common for a lot of different reasons in um, in healthcare these days. But her uh, her two physicians, w one of them signed her into the hospital and then never saw her again. The other we never heard from. 
and I would leave increasingly truculent messages for the for the pulmonologist, um, <laughs> such as when our cat got spayed, the vet called us twice a day. <laughs> uh, we never, uh, you know, but you you don't get points for being clever, uh, and. <laughs> And the only time she ever she ever called me back was when uh, the young residents on staff. This is July, by the way, and everybody says, "Oh, you can never go into the hospital in July." Well, sorry, I'll 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 remember that. Um, but uh, the young residents said they had to talk to the pulmonologist to have a certain course of treatment approved, and I said, "Well, good luck," because I I never get the phone calls returned from the pulmonologist. And I'd gone downstairs to get something to eat, and my cell phone rang. And I, of course, saw who it was, and I began the wrong way. I said, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, don't, I don't recognize this voice. Who is it? <laughs> and then she said, I, I, you know, I get a call that you're denouncing me on the, on the, on the floor. And, and I tried to make nice immediately, and I said, look, it would really, she said, we have no answers for your mother. Uh, and I said, you know, it would really help if you could just come down and tell her that, because she trusts your opinion, and she... Uh, and she said, well, I'll try tonight. She, you know, I told that to my mother. We, we never saw her. Office was four floors away. What my mother needed, and I dare say deserved, was for a physician who knew her, ideally, because she died just blocks from home, you understand, to take her by the hand and say, I'm sorry, Pat, we have no answers. Uh, I wound up doing that. Um, and, and I would have done anything for her. But I mean, I, I, I didn't have a lot of authority. Uh, on medical opinion, and uh, that's what she needed and deserved. So we would see the senior physician sometimes out in the hallway looking at screens. Uh, everything seemed to be so data-driven, and nobody really crossed that threshold and, and talked to my mother personally. And, and we've been all over this with the hospital. Uh, I, I hope it will improve. I don't, I, and let me make plain, I don't think my mother's life would have been extended by even an hour had that been any different. But I think there, uh, it, it would have cut down on some of the anxiety that we felt as a family. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Simon, uh, you, your love and adoration for your wife and especially your daughters is very evident. Do you envision or maybe daydream that many years from now, if either of the daughters has exhibited a talent for writing or as a raconteur sitting by your side and eliciting stories of your wit and your pathos, your sensitivity, capturing that in a book that will have your picture on the cover. No. Um, <laughs> I mean, and that, you know, it, that would be pretty cold comfort anyway, wouldn't it? I mean, I'd rather, uh, no, I, and you know, I, what uh, our wife, uh, my wife and I, whatever our daughters want to do is fine with us. I, of course, am, like a lot of fathers, I'm hoping that uh, they'll go into the convent. Um, <laughs> and, and you know, a, a lot of people in the clergy have written some very fine books. So maybe, uh, if, you know, if not that, but I, I don't know if we want them to be, you know, artists or writers or raconteurs. Uh, I, I think hedge fund managers is probably, <laughs> probably more what we have in mind. Yes, sir. Well, thank you, first of all. And... Let's continue on the theme of fatherhood. Now that you have these lovely daughters, um, how much of your mother's upbringing comes through in the way that you bring your children up? Oh. And I ask you this because yeah. I have a 13-year-old and I help to care for my 91-year-old mother. Oh. I, all the time. I mean, I, I, and I, I hope I live up to her example. And I use, that, I use that phrase deliberately because one of the things that my mother underscored for me is that you can talk yourself blue in the face and the only thing children really pay attention to is your example. Uh, and, 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 and she was a great one. So I hope that that's, I hope that that's on my mind. Um, you know, you, 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 you try to be the best you can. Um, there's a moment I describe in the book when we had taken my mother on a, on a trip and we were on a, we were on a boat. And uh, I think the last night of the cruise, you write your, um, you write your wish and put them in a in a empty champagne bottle and throw them off the. This this might be an environmental nightmare. <laughs> it occurs to me as I, I, I apologize in advance. Uh, 
for the sensitivities of politics and prose crowd. But in any event, that was, I think we were told that that was all right, or it was a tradition at any rate. And uh, I uh, took my mother up there. Our, my wife and kids were, were, were back in the room. I took my mother up there, and she just impulsively said, not impulsively, she made a point of saying, your father tried to be a, a great father, but he let a lot of stuff get in the way. You don't let stuff get in the way. And I hope so. I mean, if she was talking about the one thing that got in the way, certainly. But, sorry. Hi. Uh, there are two elements of your, your mother's life um, that I presume happened before you were born. Uh, that, that she was a showgirl. Yeah. Uh, and also that she had mobster connections, or she didn't have. She uh, dated a couple of mobsters. Yeah, uh, th those it, it was Chicago. L let me <laughs> let me check with the Shulmans back there. Uh, Corey, you've dated mobsters, right? Yeah, of course. Oh, I'm sorry. Good, nice to meet you, sir. Right? Yeah, that's, uh, that's, yeah. Uh, it, it was they. They were the big tippers in nightclubs. Uh, could you e elaborate upon uh, those two uh, elements in your mother's life? <laughs> uh, well, let's see. My mother was what they call a shapery. They call, forgive me, a shapery adorable, which means that she was in the chorus. She sold cigarettes. She checked coats. Um, all of this is not as glamorous as it sounds. Uh, she was the hostess at the, at the Club Alabama and the Singapore, which was on Rush Street. Uh, she also did a lot of other, you know, she also, and she would do that at night, and she would do temp office jobs during the day, where, um, so she was, to make a long story, the great Illinois writer and poet to this day, the great Chicago poet and writer to this day, of course, is Carl Sandburg. And my mother was doing a temp job during the day at a, at a LaSalle Street law firm, and the um, man with a white shock of hair came in to say that he had an appointment with an attorney, and it was Mr. Carl Sandburg. And my mother, as you always told the story, turned around to put something in a file cabinet, and she felt a pretty firm hand on her backside. <laughs> and, and she turned around, and it was the great, the visage of the great, gray poet laureate of Illinois, uh, kind of leering at her. Um, and uh, in any event, that, that's, so she, you know, the, she, there was a guy named Jack who had been, uh, if, if you're a fan of the Godfathers, as some of us are, kind of the Fredo character. He was, the, he was in the crime family and kind of the sad sack of the brothers. Uh, she had a couple dates. I'll, I'll mention the, I uh, don't mean to keep putting the Shulmans on the spot, but Marshall Caifano. Uh, Marshall Caifano, I think, was technically head of the Loop Gambling Syndicate. Uh, my mother had a couple of, of dates with him. He said to her at one point, you know, doll, you're a legitimate dame. You were married to a legitimate guy. Maybe it's best if you don't see Marshall anymore. But if you ever need my help. So, Mark, I'm sure I've told you the story. We're walking into your father's deli. And who should be at the counter in the front but Marshall Caifano? And at that point, I was just starting to read the Chicago Sun-Times. And this was as recognizable a name as Carl Sandburg for a few years. And I, probably more. And I, um, my mother, as she told me the story later, you know, she thought, no, this man had been a gentleman to me. Uh, I am not going to pretend like we don't know each other. I'm not going to walk past him. So she said, Marshall, very good to see you. Scotty and I have been at the cathedral, uh, <laughs> the holy name cathedral in Chicago. And, and we're, you know, go to a deli right after mass. And, and then she said, Scotty, I would like you to meet Mr. Marshall Caifano. And as she said, I just <gasps> look, you know, looked up like that. And he was, oh, yeah, oh, great, nice, oh, great kid, great kid. Um, <laughs> So she wasn't an organized crime figure, but my mother always said that he was an absolute, absolute gentleman. Thank you very much. In all ways. Sorry. Arthur. Yes. Hi, Scott. Hi there. Uh, this is a great presentation. I remember a few years ago you talked about how anti-Semitism had affected you personally and some of the hate mail that you received and nasty other things. When you were growing up uh, and your mother was married to three different men who you said were all Jewish, uh, no guilt, though. Uh, yeah. Did you ever experience, or did she ever experience, any hatred oh. or any nastiness because um, of that? Nastiness, maybe more than hatred. The hatred you can't really... I, this was on my mind the other day when we were in, in Chicago. We, um, my mother was always uh, 
My mother was looking at an apartment. This was on Lakeview Place in Chicago. And a uh, woman showing her around, she and my mother were playing, I guess what we referred to as Catholic geography. You know, oh, oh, you went to Immaculata, I went to Saint Scholastica, did you know Father, so, you know, that sort of thing. And apparently the, the, the rental agent said to my mother, you know, and this is a very fine building because it's restricted. <laughs> restricted being a code word for no, no Jews. And um, in any event, my mother said, oh, well, then that's going to be a problem because actually uh, my husband is Jewish and so is our little boy. And uh, in any event, she said the woman uh, was not even embarrassed or flustered. Just said, well, you're, you're right. This, this would not be the building for you. Um, and, you know, and my, um, I, yeah, my mother, my, my, my mother paid her dues <laughs> that way, too. Absolutely. I think, well, is that it for the moment? Uh, thank you very much. This has obviously been a... Um, yeah. Thank you. All right. I'll